week nine already. As I said, the end of the semester, this semester especially gets very busy between community, projects due, PEDS, projects due, exams, and now getting ready for HESI. So hold on, just keep going and you guys will make it through. This week, we're gonna be covering chapters 48, 49, muscular skeletal and articular dysfunction and neuromuscular muscular dysfunction. Um, and then to follow, I do have a PowerPoint. It's 39 slides versus my normal, usually 50, but I cover the concepts pretty well. Um, you have Kaplan that is due this week. I'm gonna tell you, I'm not going to grade it until all of the Kaplan is done, which is the pediatric ABC. I don't like to go into Kaplan twice, 75 students. I have to look up each student under each campus, go into each section and look. So I do it once. So I'm being honest with you. So if you need another week, you have it because it's not due till when the other ones are all due. Make sure you do the remediation, which means if you don't, you get 50% of your earned grade. Um, if you get 100, you don't remediate. One to two minutes per question. I don't want anything crazy, but one to two minutes per question and um, you'll get your full 100. So make sure you do. I will send you a message if I find it's not remediated and give you a chance. As long as you send me a message back that yes, you did it, um, the, the grade will stand as what it is. Also this week, there is a discussion question due. I know some of you missed it already, but it's okay. You have till Sunday. I know that most of you are studying for community exam that is also this week. So I know you're all busy. I, I, and I believe next week you also have Med Surge 2 exam, if I'm not mistaken. So, I mean, your lives right now are crazy. Um, so, you know, it's okay. Just get it into me by Sunday. The projects, I did score all of them, if you've noticed it. And I did write comments. Now, if you got less than 100, go back and look at the comments I gave you. Some of you have the ability to get a better grade. As long as you resubmit what I ask for by Sunday and send me a message that you did that, I can give you some more extra credit for it, okay? So if you got an 85 and you want more, send me back what I'm telling you and I will increase it for you. So, but let me know because 75 students to look at each one if you've done it is a lot of work. So you let me know and I will make sure that you get the points you deserve. It is a project worth 6% of your subjective grade, which is quite a bit. You know, your case studies are 5%. So this is 6% and I don't want anybody to fail because they didn't do well on that project, okay? I have seen students that have about an 80 average, 79 average, not do the project and I have seen them fail the course. So don't do that. I, it hurts me as much as it hurts you probably more because I know all of you have that ability to get me a project in. So. Again, if you have a score less than a 90 or 95, please go look at the comments I've given you. Change it, send it back, let me know, okay? You, that's the final key. Let me know that you've done that so I can do that for you. Any questions? I mean, most of those comments I have enjoyed. I know some of them are very personal to you. I've enjoyed learning about new diagnoses that I don't know all syndromes. I don't know everything there is about pediatrics. So to learn something new for me has been really good. And I do look at these assignments carefully. I do read them. You know, I, you know, look at them and I can tell sometimes that, that these diagnoses are personal to you. So thank you everybody for sharing with me. I do appreciate that. Okay, let's go ahead. Let's go on. Let's do our PowerPoint. And I wanna to try to get you guys out about 7.30 today so that you do have time to be able to, you know, relax before you go on to, you know, many of you have a class after this. So these pictures on the front of the slide are actually very important. They're good pictures depicting some things and I'm gonna briefly discuss them before I start. 
Old cast and, and crutches, you know those, okay? And But the thing is, look how neat those casts are. And pediatrics, you can get casts, maybe not as crazy as that, but at least different colors. That little baby has something on called a pavlic harness. And that's for hip dysplasia. When the hip sockets, the femoral socket bones are not in the hip and they're up a little bit, this just a little skin traction over, oh, up to about four months can, or sometimes two months, can put those hips back where they need to be. And then the bottom picture is a picture of Buck's traction. It is a skin traction, mostly in pediatrics used for femoral fractures to help pull that bone out. The key thing about this picture is I like the way it shows you how the rope goes over and down and there's a weight on the end. The big thing about Buck's traction is making sure that weight keeps free hanging to pull and maintain you know, the pull on the leg because femoral fractures are very splintery. And if you let them slip and come out of alignment again, it does cause a lot of pain. So let's go into the immobilized child. One of the most difficult things that you can have with a child is to immobilize them. Um, if they were born immobilized, it's a little different than that child who becomes sick and requires them to be on bed rest. Um, and then they feel like they're separated from friends and family, school, et cetera, et cetera. Now, congenital defects can cause this. Sometimes there's uh, degenerative disorders. We're gonna talk about muscles that degenerate and you know um, become that you can't work with them and you can't walk again after you did walk. That's very frustrating. Infections um, that can happen. And we know sometimes therapy is needed to take care of a illness and that sometimes can make you immobile. Now the muscular system, we know muscles, they will get atrophied. You think that foot drop can't happen pediatrics? I'm telling you it can. You know, so whatever you're going to do when you have an adult on bed rest, you're going to do the same thing with children. They're just smaller, they're just easy to move or easier to move around. So muscles, we know that we need to do therapy to keep those muscles moving. We know the skeletal system that the bones become more demineralized and because, you know, more brittle. And then the cardiovascular system, we know the lungs can become atelectasis and you know you can lose your lung capacity. We know uh, edema, we know um, you could get sores and decubitus. Children do get decubitus. So what we need to do is that good pulmonary toilet and exercise and incentive spirometry or aerosols or CPT, whatever needs to be done. And then of course the venous stasis or edema that we do turn position and rub and massage and do that physical therapy and range of motions. Now that child who is immobile really is away from environment and all the stimulus that it provides. You know, watching everybody do things and, you know, children do learn from looking at other people and, you know, mimicking what they've done. So it is important to be around children. Now, as they prolong their mobilization, these children who, let me say they were all, you know, mobilized because of they were born that way. That child can tolerate a little bit better. That child who becomes a mobile, who's awake, alert, active, moving, that's the one who can become um, more of an issue, requires more emotional care. They do get frustrated. They just, they wanna do things they can't do it and they become aggressive and angry. So keeping them you know, entertained, those distraction techniques is important. Children immobilized will regress. You'll see children, you know, sucking on their thumb or finger that they haven't done in, you know, years or being incontinent. Uh, you'll see those things. Now, if you have a child who's immobilized, whether from birth or due to an illness, it disrupts a family. If it's a child who is born with something that keeps them immobile, Remember that family to be able to move or to get out of the home takes a lot more. And parents are 
needing to be with that child in the room, taking away from the other children in the house. So these, uh, the family um, needs to be on some sort of schedule. They need help, they need home assistance. And those things can, you know, help, you know, the whole family be healthy. Parents and children, the siblings and the patient themselves do need to have the ability to express their frustrations, whether through individual counseling or parent groups. I know where I work, they had parent groups for every single area, whether it was a child with cerebral palsy or something neuro, um, cardiac children, or even the premature. And it's great because parents do share what they're going through and each other helps each other. And it's a really great thing. Now getting into things that can go on with muscles and bones and injuries, you know, it has to do with children normally playing up and out and playing, or it could be something with sports. We know children are very competitive and they love to win, win, win. I mean, my grandson is five and whenever he does anything, he has to win. Did I win? Did I win? And he's gonna try until he wins. Contusions, damage to soft tissue, you know, a break in a blood vessel can cause, you know, a bruising or an ecumotic area, ecchymosis. It causes swelling and pain. Now, the thing with contusions is we don't think a bruise is a big deal, but think about this. I mean, you might have a large bruise. Think about what's underneath that bruise. Is that swelling underneath stopping blood flow? from going, you know, distally to the toes, to the fingers. So, you know, neurovascular signs must be checked, making sure there is blood uh, flow. And crush injuries, those are the ones that are so, um, you don't know all what's gone on. So you think it's a little bruise on top, but there's a lot going on underneath. So again, checking blood flow and neurovascular signs and capillary refill is important. Children do dislocate different things, fingers, toes. I mean, I dislocated a toe by kicking someone and playing soccer. I mean, and I had, you know, good shoes on. It happens, you just pull it back into place. Now, these younger children, you know, these little two to three-year-olds, they like with your arms, you take and you swing them around. Well, they can get something called a nursemaid elbow. And, you know, they love it. They love to be swung around and played with, but their tendons and their ligaments are so soft and they're not stiff yet. So their arms and joints can pop out of place very easily. I mean, you just go to the doctor, he just takes and clicks and puts it back in. And then you put the, you know, arm on a sling for a little bit and rest it and they do well. And of course, don't do that swinging around anymore. Down's children are extremely flexible. They could take their legs and put them behind their head. Now be careful because with any dislocation, you worry about blood flow that could have been interrupted go into the area. So um, making sure that again, capillary refill, you know, pulses, et cetera, are there. Now sprains, I think, are the worst thing in the world. I mean, I've had sprains like crazy. I was the sports the captain of the team, you know, that person. And I know I sprained my ankle, I don't know how many times, more than I can really count. count. When playing volleyball, I remember going up, spiking a ball, coming down straight on the ankle and I could hear it rip. And then we know the first thing that happens is big swelling and then the bruising and pain like crazy. So sprains, even though they're a little thing, actually take longer sometimes to heal than a true fracture. Now strains are similar, but it is just this microscopic tear. It is painful, um, but it's not that big swelling, obvious as a sprain, but again, it is painful and it does hurt. And it's usually because you're using the same muscles over and over and over again, and it causes that pain to occur. So how do we treat these things? It's rice. I know when I, and I did it more than once, and I did it more than once, you know, every year, 
um, I would sprain my ankle and let's say volleyball. First thing I would do is put my foot way up in the air because my ankle would swell up this big. And the more it swelled, the more pain you had. So this is what we do, RICE. And this is an acronym that you should remember. Rest, ice, compress, and elevate. And then of course, immobilization. You know, years ago, we didn't put splints. We didn't cast sprains. We just wrapped it in a, you know, ace bandage. But we feel today that immobilizing it helps it to um, repair itself better and quicker. Fractures are a common injury in children. Children, and the thing is when they fall, hands down. So the most common is your arms, radia and ulnars, okay? Now, infants, if they have a fracture, their bones are soft, their tendons are soft. To fracture something in an infant takes a lot of effort. And usually it's an abuse case. Now I'm gonna tell you a story, it's not a nice one, but something you'll remember because with children, your job is to protect the child. I know if we see abuse, we wanna be angry, we wanna yell, we wanna you know, hit someone because why would you hurt a kid? But it's the reality, it does happen. So I'm in triage. I get this three month old infant in the mother's arm. He is a twin and the mother's saying there's some swelling behind his ear. So first thing I do is take it out of the mother's arm hand underneath the neck and the head, underneath the butt to put it on the scale to get an accurate weight in case they need medications. When I put my hand underneath the neck and the head, my fingers smushed into his scalp. It shouldn't be that way, okay? So I know now something's wrong and now I have to be alert, do an extremely good assessment. I assessed the whole body, didn't really see any other bruising, did my assessment, put the mother back in the waiting room in the little area for children. And I went immediately to the doctor that was in charge, told him my suspicions. And he said, take the child over to x-ray, do um, a head x-ray. And if you see anything, do what we call a body gram. You know, little three month old infants can fit on an entire x-ray um, film. So I did that film because it was actually a displaced fracture in the head, right behind the ear it was. I found a fractured humerus. I found fractured ribs, all in different levels of healing. I found a fractured femur. Now, this is not common for a three month old. So what do we do? Okay, we could scream and yell and go nuts. It's not gonna do anything. My job is to protect that infant. So we called in DCF and the police because it's not an injury. Those are not injuries that any child infant could have. Well, as I said, this was a twin. We called in the twin, almost the same injuries. Oh, it gets better. There's a two-year-old little boy called him in. He was walking around on a fractured femur. The end of the story is, is we protected those children. Okay, they were all seen, they were all admitted to the hospital until investigation found out who was doing this. Well, ended up the mother had been working many different jobs because the dad lost his job and the father was taking care of the children. And apparently when he was bathing the children, they were all crying. Can you imagine a child crying? Well, he took a kid up by the legs and smashed it against the, the tile surround in the shower. Well, I want you to know the children are safe today. The father was put in jail and the mother, you know, of course has custody of the children. Now, as much as you wanna go crazy and hit someone, it's not your job. Your job is protect the child, which is exactly what I did. I will never forget that case. Now, most injuries in children are motor vehicle or bike related and sports because, you know, kids again are competitive. So there's fractures. What are the types of fractures? Most of the time you have that simple or closed fracture, the bone cracks sometimes all the way, some partial, but it doesn't come through the skin. 
Now there is an open or compound fracture. The bone comes up through the skin. Our biggest concern is infection here because now the bone is up in the air and our concern is that they're gonna get infected. If we don't treat it, it's going to be an amputation of something. And it also could be overwhelming sepsis and you could kill the child depending on conditions. Our, our job, IV antibiotics, long course, minimum of a month in order to take care of that infection or possible infection. Complicated is when bone fragments have damaged organs or tissue. Think about rib fractures, they could go through a lung, right? Comminuted are like these little tiny, little, you, the bone is actually shattered inside, you know, the arm or the leg. And this goes, all those little pieces go into the skin surrounding. With children, the one fracture we are concerned about and really take uh, careful attention to is growth plate injuries. Um, it is at the area of the epiphyseal plate. This is where the bone grows as the child grows so that the bones get longer as you get bigger, right? If you do not take that bone and that fracture and put it back straight, you're gonna have a straight, you're gonna have a crooked arm, leg, finger, doesn't matter. Growth plate injuries, we take seriously. And it will be surgery, an open reduction internal fixation, usually pins and screws to get that bone in proper position so that the bone can grow the way it should. Now I keep saying that infants, they have these bones that are soft and pliable. They also heal extremely quick. As you can see the neonatal period before a year, two to three weeks a cast and a fractured bone can be fixed. As they get older, it's more weeks. Usually those, you know, one year to five years is four weeks. As they get older, six to eight weeks. Adolescence, more. And for me or you, well, for me, probably four or five months because I'm the older lady. But bone healing does depend on age and um, it, they do heal very quickly. So you get a child. Child is comes in, doesn't put the foot to the ground, you know, and it's hopping. Um, you know that bone is probably broke somewhere. If they try to step on it, probably just a, frac uh, a sprain versus a fracture. So we do a history. We ask the parents what's gone on. If we can, we'll get that child and ask the child, how did he, how did he fall down? Where was he when he fell down? Again, we're protecting the child to make sure. I mean, most are benign, they most are, they say the same thing, but if you catch one in a thousand and protect them from being abused, then you've done your job. So our goal when we're taking care of fractures is to make sure that it's immobilized correctly so that you restore the function and prevent uh, deformities. We put cast on children, okay? Cast are great, but parents need to be taught the six P's, very important. Also nurses need to know it. So if you're seeing too much pain or pain gets worse as the uh, cast is on, that the fingers or toes are becoming pale with no pulse, you can't move them They're, you know, you can't feel them. You feel them swollen in there. Something's wrong, probably compartmental syndrome or something, or the cast is too tight. So we really need these parents to know so that we can get these children you know, to the doctor to get another cast put on. Now that arm there, that big black arm is the extreme that can happen, but I'm telling you, it can happen. Obviously it did because there's a picture of one. Now, children are actually fun to cast. And what actually is a distraction for those children who really understand is they can pick their own color for their cast in pediatrics, usually in a pediatric hospital. I mean, adults all get white casts. That's what they get. That's no fun for a kid, is it? So to be able to do a cast that's your team colors or your favorite colors or the color of the season makes it a lot more fun for a child. 
that's where their mind will be thinking, not getting the cast on the pain that will occur. Also, in pediatrics, we'll do things like this doll here. We're going to put cast on that child's leg, the doll's leg that matches her leg. So it's actually fun. Now, we need to teach children how to take care of their cast and what to do or not do. You know, remember, I live in Florida. There's a lot of water. There's a lot of pools. I've seen many a kid with just a short cast to the elbow, go home, put on their bathing suits, run out and jump in the pool. And now you got a wet cast. I saw one kid do it three times. <laughs> After the third time, I said, I don't want to see you here anymore. So I said, so tell me, what did you do wrong? What shouldn't you do? And I didn't see him again. So thank goodness. At home, bathing, showering, they usually will put a bag on them, whether it's a garbage bag. We have these bags that we canned out, but you know, they're got to use them for four to six weeks. So sometimes they, you know, do other stuff or just not putting the arm or leg in the shower or bath helps. And then um, remember as it's on, skincare is important. You know, teaching them nothing inside the cast. Don't take your pencils and stick it in there because it itches. You know, a little cool hair dryer actually works very well. And then, of course, at home, telling them how to keep it elevated and put an ice on it for the first 24 hours does help with swelling. Now, I mentioned traction in the beginning, that picture that I showed you. In children, we use mostly skin traction. In the past, we've used skeletal traction for a fractured femur. Now, a fractured femur is the long bone and the leg, and it does tend to have splinters on the end. So you'll see them sticking into the skin and the nerves and the muscle spasms, it is painful. So you take and you pull with weight and you get that bone aligned and you keep that weight on and don't remove it. And it will decrease all of the pain and help the child, you know, tolerate this fractured femur <clears throat> until we can do surgery. Usually surgery is done in a day or two, but you know, if we have to delay it, at least we can keep a child comfortable. So the traction, as I said, it helps the pain, helps the decrease muscle spasms, and it actually starts the healing process because as soon as you break it, you will be healing and that prevents that um, deformities. So types of traction, you know, these are skeletal and these are skin traction. When I talk skeletal, it's pins inside the body. When I talk about skin, it's something applied to the skin that will pull, okay? There's Bryant, Bucks, Russell. These are due, due to something pulling. You know, this little baby up here probably has hip dysplasia. We're pulling those um, legs out. Sometimes it's done that way. Um, again, we know that there's the bucks that's usually used for the fractured femur. Remember, there's a pulley and there's a weight. There is 24 hours a day it must stay there. You take it off, those bones will come apart and they will poke into the muscles and create a lot of pain. We don't want that. Sometimes like with uh, cervical injuries, we'll put on this sometimes halo. Usually that's a post-op sort of thing. These Gardner Well tongs are also used for the uh, cervical area. Sometimes we can't put a cast on, we can't put you know, traction on, we'll do something called an external fixation device. Sometimes an infant is born and they have one leg shorter than the other or one arm shorter than the other. They can actually break that bone, put the skeletal traction device on and that bone can be lengthened. So the child's not gonna have a short leg or short arm and it can be used very well. These kids run around with these things. They tolerate it very well. The only thing we do as nurses Again, there's pins into the skin. We're going to look at the pin site and do pin care, whatever the physician says. Sometimes it's just soap and water, keep it clean. 
Sometimes it's peroxide. There's all different treatments. <coughs> now, sometimes a limb is not there at birth. Sometimes a bone of a limb is not there at birth. And you need both bones of the arm or the leg in order for that limb to function. I had a friend whose daughter um, had a missing fibula at birth. So they had to do a below the knee amputation. I met this little girl when she was four years old. She came over to my house and my kids were like 10 and 12. This little four-year-old was chasing my kids around with her prosthesis, trying to bop my kids over the head with it. Up and down the stairs, mobile, it was like nothing for her. So because they're born without a limb, they tolerate it well. Sometimes these children are born and there's some medical condition that happened that requires amputation, just like adults. Our concern, of course, at that time is pain management, phantom pain, because they do have that, you know, and then getting fitted for prosthesis. So these children, just like adults, can be as close to normal activities as they can. Now, sports injuries, you know, children love to be competitive. They love to compete. They love to do different things. Basketball is a thing my grandson at five years old right now. How many times can I bounce that basketball all together? He's up to 150 right now. Bounce, a bounce, a bounce, a bounce. So in my house, I'm hearing bouncing basketballs. But he's competitive. He wants to learn. He wants to know. We know it's great. It's good for them. But we need to be concerned that there's that overload injuries. Children who's doing the same movement over and over again can have that. And with sports, of course, we need proper equipment to be safe, whether it's shin pads, whether it's wrist pads, helmets, whatever it is, these children need it to be able, you know, to be safer. As I said, there are these things called overuse injuries where you're using the same muscles over and over and over and over again. And it does cause these things, stress factors, fractures or ligaments that are stretched and the treatment is just rest. Don't do those things again. But you know, sometimes you have adolescents that are trying to get that sports scholarship, you know, or you have those, you know, athletes who want to go to the Olympics or whatever. They're going to be overusing, overusing, overusing. <clears throat> So <clears throat> at birth, we take our infant, we go for the first visit at the pediatrician. And what does he do? One of the things he takes the legs up and down to the side and he moves them around. Why is he doing that? Well, he's looking for a developmental dysplasia of a hip, which means that hip socket, that ball that goes into the hip is either higher or all the way out, okay? So if the hip, that socket's supposed to be in the hip and it's up here, we know that leg is gonna be shorter because it's up too high. We know girls are more than boys with hip dysplasia. So we have that shortened leg and we're going to see, if we look at their buttocks, those gluteal folds, one's gonna be higher than the other or the leg folds, depending on what you see. You're going to see a positive Ortolani <clears throat> and a positive Barlow's test. You're gonna hear the clicking and stuff going on so you know it's out of joint. So how do we take care of a dislocated hip on these infants? Well, remember it's only two to three weeks for these guys to be able to heal. So we're gonna put them in that Pavlik harness. 23 hours a day. We only take it off for them to bathe, okay? Keep those legs up so that it can go back into position. Now, usually two to four months, you're gonna see it back into place. It does well, no surgery, and that's all it needed was that harness. Sometimes it doesn't get back where it should. So about six months or more, 
they'll say, all right, it hasn't worked. And now they're trying to walk. So now it's becoming more of an urgency. They might do surgery or they might put a spica cast on, which is a cast from the abdomen down to the knees. And it holds those you know, um, legs where they should. So hopefully those hips, the socket goes back into where it needs to be. Now, as you get older, your tendons become more rigid and more tough and thickened. So older children need surgery to do a tenotomy, which means they're gonna cut the tendon, open it up so it can stretch, so we can get that ball and socket back where it should be. Another deformity that can occur with a foot and ankle is called a club foot. Now, you do not need to know all these names. All you need to know is that the foot and the ankle could be in, out, over, under, in any position. That's what that is. So our goal, because these children, infants born like this, eventually need to walk. So we need the foot and ankle to be in appropriate position. So we need to correct that deformity. The easiest way is the Poncetti method or serial casting. Now, this is a great thing, it's just cast and we replace it every week. Now, why every week? Well, didn't I tell you, it's only two to three weeks that things are healed. So we're gonna slowly, slowly, slowly put that ankle and those feet where they should be. This mother must make sure every week she comes back and gets a new cast put on. If she waits longer, that ankle or foot could be already healed at an inappropriate angle. And it will then, of course, how are we going to get it back to where it needs to be? So we don't want to do that. Now, osteogenesis imperfecta is another name for brittle bone which means these children's bones break easy. Sometimes picking them up and just, you know, squeezing the ribs a little bit, they could crack. I'm telling you, it's very easy to break these bones. It is something that um, these children, it's hereditary, genetic. And um, sometimes we know by birth um, that they're gonna have it, sometimes not. Um, these children, there's no cure. These, they will suffer with constant fractures. Um, they do give IV biphosphonate therapy, calcium, vitamin D, all of those things. It helps a little, but it's not a cure. Our goal is to keep these children in a functional position so they can get up, get out of bed and get into a wheelchair so they're not immobile, right? We want them to move. Now, these children, um, they're adorable. And what's great about them is, I mean, working in a hospital, pediatric facility, these children would be in their electric wheelchairs and maybe it's one finger that works, it's not broke. And they're in their electric wheelchairs going down the hall to go to the cafeteria to get a snack, a treat or whatever. And you're gonna hear them, beep, 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 you know, and you turn around and here's this kid with the electric wheelchair and but they're, they're able to be mobile, able to get around and it gives them such pleasure. And if their bones are always breaking, they're always in pain to give them that pleasure. For me, I just smile whenever I see it. Leg calf birth disease, aseptic necrosis of the femoral head. What happens, blood supply? to the head of the femur is interrupted for some reason. They don't know, it just happens. You will see these children, usually males, ages four to eight. So most of the time it's just one hip. So you will see a child all of a sudden start to limp or they don't can't move the leg good. Um, you'll see it worse in the morning. And usually it becomes to the point where parents will come in and say, He's limping, he's not in sports, I don't know what happened. They'll do an x-ray and they'll find out that this child has a um, aseptic um, necrosis of the head of the femur. It's like this little fuzzy white appearance on the x-ray. And then they will go on to do an MRI to see how much it has uh, gone into the bone. So 
our goal is we don't want the head of that femur to disappear or unless you want to do a total hip replacement on a, you know, a four-year-old. So we want to keep those bones and that femoral head intact. So what is our job? How do we treat these? Well, we put them on bed rest, okay? Get the weight off of them. Um, sometimes we'll do that buck's traction to pull the leg to keep it in alignment. And for pain, just NSAIDs, you know, your Motrin, your ibuprofen, you know, one of those. Um, sometimes, but rarely, is surgery. Now I'm gonna give you three conditions involving the spine. The first is kyphosis. And this is a convex angulation of the thoracic spine. You heard it said like it's um, humpback. You'll see the elderly with their, you know, bent over at that area. And that's what kyphosis is. Lordosis is an inward curvature of the, of the lumbar spine. And you'll see them, you know, sort of their abdomens pushed out. And then scoliosis. When you think of scoliosis, think of S or S curved spine, okay? So scoliosis is an S curve. It could be from birth, but mostly you will see scoliosis with that pre-adolescent growth spurt. You'll see one shoulder go up and one go down. And then you'll look at the spine and you'll see it, you know, S shaped. So how do we treat scoliosis? Well, depends on the degree of ang you know, angulation. How many degrees are they curved? Well, greater than 40, that's gonna be surgery, which is Harrington rods or Lukey rods. You do surgery, you take rods on either side of the spinal column, connect it and try to get it as straight as you can. You'll never be perfect, but straight as possible. You know, these S shapes that are really, you know, great, greater than 40 degrees, push over into the lungs. So one lung's capacity is diminished. So this is something that impedes the respiratory function. So it does need surgery to correct it. Most of the time, all we need to do is bracing and then exercise. Now, this is a pre-adolescent, adolescent child. What's their big thing? Body image, right? And here we are with this brace on and they can't even wear cool clothes because they're in this brace, right? So trying to make this brace more appealing, like this girl has this little leopard thing going on. They're doing better than just white brace. You know, and then telling the child wear looser clothes, you know, that it, that can help. But they have to be on 23 hours a day again. 23 hours a day, take it off for bathing, they sleep with it, okay? Very important. And then exercise to strengthen those muscles so that we can get that spine as straight as possible. Osteomyelitis. It's an infection of the bone. Usually you've had a cut, you've banged it. You know, I've seen a lot of big toes. One of the things I see a lot with children. Um, and it starts with swelling, pain, redness. Sometimes they start to see a streak going up the foot too. So symptoms also, fever. You know, there is an infection. Osteomyelitis is a really difficult infection to cure. It's a staph infection. It can become systemic and could be extremely dangerous. You will see elevated leukocytosis. You'll see elevated white counts. You're going to see, um, go do uh, all sorts of cultures just to make sure what is the um, organism that's creating this infection. As I said, mostly times it is staph. And then we'll do those x-rays and bone scans to make sure of what we're seeing. Now, once we determine that it is an osteomyelitis, as soon as we can, we're going to start IV antibiotics. And it will be minimum of three to four weeks up to several months until it's dissipated, till it's gone. These um, 
infections usually require those amino glucosides. These are your CIN drugs, your antibiotics like vancomycin. These are the ones we do peak and troughs on. These are ones that with toxicity can create kidney damage and hearing problems. So these are side effects to it. Osteomyelitis, they should be on bed rest. I'll monitor your pain as you can. And remember nutrition. You think always of bone muscle, think of high protein. These children need good protein in their diet. And remember now, these are immobilized children, making sure that they have enough distraction to keep their spirits up because it could be a couple months. Now we did talk about cancer, but we didn't talk about bone or muscle type cancers. So I'm gonna give you um, some of these. So Ewing sarcoma is a malignant bone tumor. It's usually in children and adolescents. It's not adults. And what you see is a bone that the tumor grows on. It's any bone, femur, tibula, tibia, ulna, humerus. This is a scapula where you can see that big area. It's like, doesn't, it's bigger than the other side. How do we treat this? Well, radiation, to shrink it. Chemotherapy, because of cancer, we wanna get rid of it. And then if we can, we'll do a surgical resection to get rid of it. And again, we always in any cancer with bones, we try to preserve any limb that's affected, just like we did for the um, osteosarcoma, the, the femoral with, with the cancer on it. Our diagnosis, if it's without metastasis, they do a lot better and a possible cure. Rhabdomyosarcoma is another cancer. It comes from muscles, tendons, bursa, fascias, fascia. It is in either the gums, the nose, the eye, ears. Um, it can go to the perineum, but usually you will see the ones, you know, that are more obvious and visible. And these children, it's a highly, highly malignant tumor and it many times does metastasize. So getting that tumor out completely is what we need to do. We do again, radiation to shrink it and chemotherapy, but this one, because it's so highly malignant, we do long-term chemotherapy up to two years to keep the cancer away and to get any little, any cancer that's there. Now, juvenile idiopathic arthritis. It used to be called JRA, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. This could be caused from an immune something, environmental, they don't know. Um, I wish they did, because I have rheumatoid arthritis. I wish it wasn't anything that anybody, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. In children, Usually you'll see it ages one to three. Sometimes we don't even know they have it. It could be mild. So sometimes it does go undiagnosed. But what would you see with a child with JIA? Well, it's always in the morning after not moving your joints and your legs and your fingers all night long, they become stiff, they become swollen and it's hard to walk, it's hard to bend, hard to move. Sometimes the way we diagnose it is this uveitis. We're gonna see the eyes and we're like, something's going on and then ask more questions. And then we do see joint swelling and limp and worse in the morning. Now, it's extremely difficult to diagnose. You know, I wish there was one test, you know, you, give me a JIA test and it's negative or positive. It's not that way. For instance, me, took them 10 years to diagnose me, 10 years. They kept saying you're fibromyalgia. And that's what they do. Even with children, they'll, they'll give them something else or maybe it's emotional because these, these tests, they could be positive, negative, positive, negative. So it's hard to pin it down. But what are the tests that they do? Anything that does with inflammatory factors, 
the sedimentation rate monitors inflammation, right? In children, even adults, they do this C-reactive protein. It monitors inflammation. They'll do the ANA, which is anti-nuclear antibodies. But again, it can be positive, negative, positive, negative. It was for me, so I know children too. Also rheumatoid factor, positive, negative. Now, when there is a lot of pain, you might see this leukocytosis, elevated white counts um, in it. And sometimes that can help diagnose, but as you're hearing me say, very difficult to diagnose. So there's no cure, but we need to do something to prevent the body from attacking the joints, from making deformities and to take away that pain. Because when your joints swell, it hurts. And if it swells and you're not treating it, it can cause deformities. I mean, I got a finger that's going crooked on me. And um, it's just part of what it is. It is a treatment of taking care of pain and then preventing the body from attacking it. And we do that with NSAIDs. Ibuprofens work very well. And then we do the slow acting anti-rheumatic and methotrexate. And you're saying methotrexate for cancer, right? Well, it also is used to prevent the body from attacking itself in rheumatoid arthritis. Um, in flares, when there's severe pain, they do use corticosteroids, which is a Band-Aid. It helps for the moment, but it's not used for a long term. I mean, there's so many side effects for corticosteroids, the weight gain, and then you're um, more susceptible to infections and glucose and blah, 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 there's so much. I mean, corticosteroids are great, but there's lots of side effects. So how are you gonna take care of this kid? Well, we wanna keep the pain at a minimum. That's number one. And if we can do that, we need to keep this kid moving. So physical therapy, occupational therapy, and as we are moving and you know, keeping those joints moving, it does help. Sometimes the pain, we need to either apply heat or cold. Now, some people love heat. Don't put it on me. I will scream, it makes it worse. Give me cold. I will stick my feet in a bucket of ice water and that works, but everyone is different. So ask your child what they like. The other immune problem that can occur is systemic lupus erythematosus. And this is where your body attacks organs. It happens in girls, women, ages 10 to 19, African-American, Asian, Hispanic, um, and there is a familiar tendency. So it can run in families. We don't know why. We don't know why it happens. We think, well, maybe at 10, it's that going into puberty, could be hormone, could be a, something immune going on, environmental exposure to drugs, infection, stress, again, we don't know, but overexposure to sunlight. I live in Florida, you know, sun is great, but again, we also need to use sunscreens and we need, need to limit the amount of time in the sun. Now to diagnose this, what do you see? You're gonna see these um, cutaneous lesions. You're gonna see butterfly rash of some sort. You'll even see it in infants, little rashes on their faces. If the, you know, the child is that 10 to 19 girl, you'll see that nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and you'll see just generalized weakness and pain, almost like an arthritic looking thing. But what makes that diagnosis a little bit more is when they start with this forgetful seizures, paralysis. Okay, let me go looking now, what's happening? Pleurisy, pericarditis, so now we're attacking lungs and heart and then proteinuria, you know, this is now, it's attacking the kidneys. So what is our goal in lupus? Well, in anything that we're working with, with children is we wanna keep these kids being kids. Let them be with normal activities as they can be. So supportive care. We're going to give them the medications they need. Most of the time, these children are on low dose steroids, you know, prednisone. 
We want them to um, have as minimal exasperations as possible. And again, you know, teaching these parents the simple thing about sunlight and monitoring the amount of time and using sunscreens. So Kirsten is 10 years old, sustained a fracture in the epiphyseal plate of her right fibula when she fell out of a tree. When discussing the injury with her parents, the nurse should consider what? Which one? <laughs> what is an epiphyseal plate? It's the growth plate. Yes, it is. So the answer is B. And remember, you don't get that straight and corrected right. You're going to have a crooked or a shortened extremity. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, chapter 49, neuromuscular muscular dysfunctions. Cerebral palsy, okay? Cerebral palsy is a disorder that uh, affects movement and postures causing activity limitations because they can't move the way that they should. So it's abnormal muscle tone and coordination. It is the most common permanent physical disability in children. Many children, 15 to 60% also have epilepsy. So it's cerebral palsy that you're treating and also treating for seizures. Why? What happens with cerebral palsy? Why do children get it? Well, it could be because of their brain, some abnormality there, could be due to some occlusion. You have a vascular occlusion, you're not getting blood somewhere, you're not getting oxygen, nutrition, it can cause it. It could be due to that effects of a low birth weight. Now, low birth weight, you're gonna have a child who um, has uh, a brain and tissues and um, vessels in the brain that are very fragile. And many times they burst and they bleed into the brain, into the fifth ventricle. And what happens is, is it could be on a grade from one to four, and it can cause, again, an area of hypoxia where it's not getting what it needs. And that causes um, that cerebral palsy to occur. Now, how do we then, we've known, we've seen risk factors now. Child was born premature. Child had a difficult birth. So we know the possibility of a hypoxic episode is there. And then we find out the child's had a grade three intraventricular hemorrhage. Very common. I mean, sometimes just hitting an isolate or a loud noise can cause their brains to bleed. That's how serious it is taking care of these tiny little infants of one pound, a pound and a half. So what do you see on examination? So these children are growing. We're not gonna see those fine motor moves, you know, those fingers using those. Decrease gross motor. They're not gonna be lifting up, turning over, doing things, you know, in the time frame they should. And this will get you wondering, what's going on? So how do we then diagnose to? <clears throat> well, it's the history, it's the examination, but then doing neuroimaging that can help. We're also gonna do metabolic testing on the child to make sure it's not a metabolic condition causing it. And of course, parents do need genetic testing to see if something else is going on. So again, what do you see with them? Delayed gross motor, abdor abnormal motor performance. Sometimes they're, most of the time you think of cerebral palsy, you think of that very spastic and the arms are just tense all the time. You know, I think of cerebral palsy and I think of my little Jonathan, six years old was my favorite little boy, my boyfriend at the um, daycare, the prescribed pediatric daycare for children, which you know, these are your CP, your Downs, ADHDs, and many other things. But little Jonathan would see me and the smile would go ear to ear and his hands would go up and they would get stiff because he knows I'm gonna, I'm gonna go over there, give him a big hug and a kiss. And he was so happy. These children are smart. These children are more aware than you think. And Jonathan is nonverbal, but he knows what's going on. 
<clears throat> and he is performing things that years ago we wouldn't even check. This kid is actually learning shapes and colors and reading through a uh, pad that he got where he can touch it and show me what he wants. So years ago, we used to just care for these children. Today, we are giving them goals of learning and these children are getting to these goals and then making higher goals. So cerebral palsy today, these children can, um, we're showing how smart that they can be. Now it's not gonna be a normal child, but they do more than you really think. So what about that child who's not as severe um, cerebral palsy like my Jonathan? Um, some of them are mild. And you know we'll put braces on them to help keep alignment so they can walk easier. And um, our goal is to be able to get them to move around, to have locomotion so that they can get from place to place. So they're not you know, immobile in the one corner. <clears throat> we want to have them to have the ability to communicate like that pad that I was telling you about with Jonathan. And we want to teach them to do little things. It could be just brushing teeth with, you know, a big toothbrush. It could be those little things. And these kids get really excited if they can do it. We want them to do as much as they possibly can. And, you know, today, as I said, education, speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, and then putting them in social environment where they're around children and it, normal children where they can learn and see and they can try to mimic what they're doing. And this does help the children. So we manage them how, I mean, I've mentioned it, it's those ankle foot braces that we take off and on. <clears throat> and these help keep you know, the feet in a position that maybe he's four years old and can't walk now, but maybe with all of the work we're doing by six or seven, he can walk. But what if he now has foot drop because we didn't put splints on? So it's important that we do maintain, you know, that um, good positioning and posture. Pharmacological treat, um, treatment, uh, a lot of times we're going to give uh, botulism injections to decrease the spasm. I mean, little Jonathan ended up getting the levodopa, carbidopa medicine that is used for Parkinson's. You know, that little spasms of Parkinson. Well, what is spastic cerebral palsy? It mimics almost the same thing. And I'm telling you with him, he did improve and had less spasms. So they're using all different things. You know, dental hygiene, so important. He's nonverbal. He doesn't eat by mouth. He's unable to. He has a gastrostomy tube, but his mouth, you know, you could see um, it needs really good care. And then of course, all the therapies. Prognosis, 85% can achieve ambulation, okay? If you work with them, early, early intervention, we can do good. We know cerebral palsy, there's gonna be some sort of cognitive delay. Some, and it's, you know, that very mild to quite severe, but we don't look at their impairment. We look at what they can do and we'll work on that. Children um, need their families to be able to understand what's going on, how to treat for them, have the equipment that they need and um, how they can get you know, all the therapies that they do need. And these families need support. A child with cerebral palsy, these families need help taking care of them. You know, I've seen one day, um, the last summer I worked you know, with these children at this prescribed pediatric daycare, they had a backyard and they had these little pools that they filled up. And they took these children with cerebral palsy. Some they sat in the pool. Some of them, they just lay down and let them splash the water or kick with their feet. And if you could see the excitement and smiles, it was worth all of it to watch them play. Did you ever, think when you were doing pharmacology, folic acid says it prevents neural tube deficits. You're like, you remembered those words, but what is a neural tube deficit, right? 
Well, now you're going to learn what a neural tube deficit is. We're going to be concerned about spina bifida and myelomeningocele.s Those are the ones, you know, that um, are the neural tube deficits. Something happens during, you know, the very beginning of pregnancy, and the neural tube doesn't close, so it's on the outside of the body. Now we've talked about gastroschisis, the stomach. We've talked about the bladder, bladder extrophy. Now we're talking that the, um, this child is gonna have the meninges and the spinal cord stretched out on the outside of the lower back. Well, remember I just said stretched out? That means those nerves have been stretched. Many of them um, damaged because of that. So this is in the lower back, which is your lumbar area. So nerves, where does it go? Goes to the legs, right? You're gonna have decreased sensation and motor to lower legs, sometimes no motor or sensation, but also you're not gonna have the feeling to urinate. So monitoring urinary function is important. Also, they can't push to move their bowels. So we'll be monitoring their um, urinary function and their bowel function and we will be exercising their low legs and to keep them again in a position where they can get up out of bed and sit in a wheelchair. Now, neural tube deficits could be due to that folic acid, but it could be due to maternal obesity, diabetes, or low B12 levels, they think. You know, again, they don't know all the answers to this. So you have an infant born, myelomeningocele. They can see this on ultrasound, so the child will be a C-section. This is the only child you're gonna place prone on their bellies. It's not back to sleep with these guys, it's on their bellies. We take and put a sterile covering on that area to prevent infection. So that is important. Now, many of these children will require um, catheterization for urine output. So latex allergy immediately. We don't let them get allergic before we put it on it. We do it immediately. So again, you need to watch their urine and their bowels. These kids can be brilliant. I had a child, Manuel Louis, born myelomeningocele. Looked very similar to this little booty that's sticking here, this cute little baby. <clears throat> the mother was crying next to the bed. And it wasn't my kid, but I was the only nurse in the room. So I'm not gonna let a mother cry. So I went up to the mother, I said, what's the matter? And she goes, well, the doctors have no, you know, tell me there's not a lot of hope for my child. And I'm really scared. So I says, mom, your baby is beautiful. He's gonna be fine. Now, he's gonna have things that you're gonna have to work with, but I can see already, you'll be a good mommy. I said, he may have some, decreased strength in his you know, lower legs. I said, but he's gonna, look how beautiful he is. So what I did was sit down mom in the chair next to him, his nice big you know, recliner chair, took the baby, wrapped him up and put him in her arms. And I said, now love your baby. Look how beautiful he is. Now the end of the story is 14 years later, she found me in the emergency room and she said to the lady, go get her, I know her. Brought me over and she says, are you Boop? And I said, cause I'm Betty Boop when I was at the hospital. That was my nurse name. And I go, yes. She goes, do you know who he is? And I looked at her and I said, is that Manuel Louis? I had no understanding. I don't know where my car keys are, but I remembered his name. She pulled out this key ring that had a picture. She said, with her keys on that had a picture of me holding him when he was an infant. And she said, you gave me hope. You gave me that strength that made me help my son. He just went to his eighth grade prom and he's in regular school and he has all A's and B's. And I wanna thank you because you're the one that helped me when I needed it the most. So nurses do a lot. 
and nurses do give that hope. And don't forget that just because they have a disability, he was a smart kid and he gave me a hug and kiss and told me, thank you. So it was a nice comeback for me. Again, we know folic acid, 0.4 milligrams, should be started before, a month before you get pregnant, but we don't always know when we're getting pregnant. I know I didn't. So, I mean, it happens all the time. So you wanna get pregnant, take a multivitamin, which has folic acid. Now we're gonna talk about some muscular dystrophies or their muscles tend to waste. So this right here, uh, Werdig Hoffman, again, is an autosomal recessive that's passed on. And these children, usually about two months old, they'll realize something's not right. The kid's not lifting its head up, not doing voluntary, involuntary grasp, something's going on. These children don't cry loud or cough. They're just lay there, they don't move. And these children usually die by the age of two. Respiratory failure. Now I've told you that Tetralogy of Flow will be on your NCLEX. Duchenne muscular dystrophy will be on your, your NCLEX, guaranteed. Well, what is Duchenne muscular dystrophy? Well, it is the most severe and most common of all muscular dystrophies. It's X-linked and it's from mommy. It is boys ages three to seven. So they're born fine, walking around, okay. And then all of a sudden they start shuffling gait. They start falling down. They start not being able to get up without taking their hands and walking up their legs to stand up. Something's going on and you start to see that. You will see a, these children um, progressively get worse and worse. These children do have a mental impairment from a little bit to a lot. And because, <clears throat> excuse me, and because they're not moving as they should, we need to be really careful of obesity because they're not burning calories. So we don't know what to do for them, but we do know with muscle atrophy and declining, we need to keep those muscles moving. So keep the child active, range of motion, physical therapy, bracing, whatever we need to do. And then of course, genetic counseling. Um, so mom knows, you know, in case they want another child. Gillian Bure. <coughs> Gillian Bure is an ascending weakness that occurs in children about ages four to 10. Can it also uh, um, go into adults too? I've seen, you know, an adult with it also. And it's a demyelination of the, the nerves. So from the feet, it starts again, shuffling, falling, weakness. Then you might see um, you're having incontinence. You can't hold your urine, constipation. And our biggest concern with the nerves that are just failing is it's going to go to that phrenic nerve. And the phrenic nerve does supply the diaphragm so that you can breathe. So these children go apneic. There's no nerve. It doesn't move at all. What is our treatment? Well, these children, if we're seeing it in the earlier stages, we'll be monitoring their O2 saturations and heart rate because respiratory is our biggest concern. So we will be watching that. When it gets up to where it's affected the respiratory system, they'll be intubated. They might even be having a tracheostomy and we'll be taking care of an immobile child, okay? These children, again, physical therapy needs no foot drop. We don't want the cubitus turning, positioning, and working with their lungs to keeping them open. And we treat these children with intravenous immunoglobins, maybe steroids, but it's IVIG on these children. And it can take two weeks 
four weeks. Every child is different. We don't know. But again, our treatment is to prevent complications. So it starts from the feet, it works up, and then it goes, all of a sudden you start breathing again, and then it works down. Tetanus. <coughs> now we know we get a tetanus shot every 10 years. Now tetanus is a disease where the muscles tend to get tight to the point where it's painful from the clavicles up. So the neck gets tight to the point where it is painful. When it gets like that, you'll see swelling going on. And you will see these children start then not being able to swallow. It will affect their lungs because of all of this swelling and, and this tightness that's going on there. And then you'll see this rigidity going on. So we treat this child, we'll intubate this child. Now, the pain is so severe, the pain we need to treat. How do we treat it? Well, we're going to paralyze, sedate, and we're going to give these child really um, powerful muscle relaxants. Now, we're gonna be giving these children this, to this tetanus toxoid, and we will be giving it till um, they, um, the muscles start to relax. Um, these children are sick. Many die. They say that if we have this child four days under treatment and they're still alive, probably the kid will make it, but usually they'll die before that. So treatment during this time, we're gonna cheat. We're gonna treat the wound where the tetanus got into the body. And then we're going to be given the tetanus toxoid antitoxin in order you know, to fight this tetanus. These kids, as I said, are sick. They're in the ICU. And again, IV, tetanus, immune globins, wound care, muscle relaxant sedatives, and a paralytic agent. Now, have any of you had an infant that um, was constipated and grandma says, give a little bit of honey or give a little bit of Cairo syrup to your child. It'll help. It's an old fashioned you know, treatment. Don't do it because, and this is the reason, we don't know if the honey was sterilized and properly, you know, bottled. And this colostrum botulum can be inside it. And when you give them the honey, now you've given them the disease, okay? It happens about 12 to 36 hours after you give it to them. Now, an infant, you might see vomiting, difficulty swallowing, or you start hearing their cry seems to be different. It causes progressive life-threatening respiratory paralysis. This is from a little bit of honey. So what do we do? We give IV botulism immunoglobin. And as I said, it's respiratory again. We're gonna monitor the respiratory support. You know, we're going to give them ventilators, whatever they need. And of course, always maintaining nutrition in any illness in children. Nutrition, nutrition, nutrition. Now, spinal cord injuries, you know, can be a result of um, almost anything. Of course, motor vehicles, always the injury up at the top of the list. Sports injuries. You know, I had a little boy, 16. He was playing baseball, slid into third base and his head hit the knee of the defender and the crowd heard a crack. He had a angulated, instead of a straight cervical spine, it was angulated. I mean, quite intense, angulated. Came in, I uh, was the primary trauma nurse that day and he had paralysis on the right leg and almost complete on the left, but he could feel it. So you know there's spinal cord injury there, right? This was a rough one. It can happen during birth trauma or in a car accident. Hyperflexion, hyperextension can also cause those injuries. So when this kid came to me, the 16-year-old, and he has this, you know, already neuro deficit in the lower extremities, he was talking to me and he was scared. So of course I talked to him. So 
my job, priority, because nothing else matters. Keep that neck straight in a mobile, which means any turning, positioning, anything, you're not gonna do it without me making sure I'm in charge. Now, this child, they ended up doing an MRI out of the emergency room. <clears throat> we don't do it much because it's involved, but this child really needed it to see exactly the damage and if the spinal cord was intact at all. I was there protecting his neck the entire time. Now, let me fast forward it. He went to the um, ICU, they put tongs in his head, they pulled it, kept his neck straight, put him on a cooling blanket, gave him good sedation and big steroids, had surgery the next day. Two weeks later, I went upstairs to see him, see how he was doing. He had only minimal, minimal um, decreased sensation on the right leg. And the next day he was gonna go to therapy, um, out, um, inpatient therapy. And the kid a year later came to see me. He was perfect. That spine, because I kept my eye and didn't let them move, I prevented that child from being paralyzed. And I'll never forget him because when he saw me a year later, he hugged me and he told me, thank you. So a progressive infantile spinal muscular atrophy and the most common paralytic form of the floppy infant syndrome, what is the name? Do you remember? It's not Duchenne. I didn't talk about A or B. Oh, it is C, Wording Hoffman. Okay, a lot of stuff. A lot, a lot, a lot of stuff. Who wants to win today? Christy, you're gonna win? How about you, Boris? And Jeanette, you like to win. Yeah, gonna try. Deshana, you wanna win? Yeah. Okay, Boris, you're gonna do it, right? <laughs> Marla is gonna win. Who is? Marla, she wants to win. Oh, Marla, are you gonna win? Are you with me, Marla? Is everybody behind the names here? I'm, I'm here. here. I'm here. All right. I don't see you, I don't know. You could be asleep. You could be eating dinner. Here we go. There's 39 questions. I'm gonna go as quick as I can. <clears throat> I will be getting this recording up as soon as I can so that you have it for your exam next week. Um, also, I will be doing my review tomorrow at 2 p.m. and I will get that up uh, by Friday evening so that you do have it. I will place the cahoots there on that, re that announcement so it's in one place. And of course, I'll always reattach, you know, the PowerPoint. I need more than two people. Anybody else? All right, let's get going. Week nine, I'm still amazed it's week nine already. A multi-select. What is the priority for a nurse to assess following a CAST application? Remember, this is what we need to teach parents so we keep our children safe so they don't lose an arm or a leg. And it's all of these things, pulses, pain, sensation, movement, and there's six of them, paler. 
paralysis. What should the nurse monitor after a soft tissue injury? So you have a bruise, it's big, or a crush injury, which is a bruise. What do you want to look at? What is our concern? I mean, how much swelling is going on? And has it occluded a vessel there? So neurovascular signs are your biggest thing. We don't want to lose an arm or a leg. A fracture that penetrates the skin is called. The most common is a simple fracture. What is this one called? You could call it open, but there's another name. So this is your compound fracture, good. What is priority nursing care for a child who fell off the second floor balcony? And I've actually had this case, kid fell off second floor balcony, opened the door, went out, got between it and went out. And the kid was like two years old. And again, our first priority is that immobilization of the spine. Because if we have that spine that now, you know, it breaks, you're talking about respiratory compromise, paralysis, et cetera. So spine immobilization, most important. Principles of managing soft tissue injuries. You get a sprain, what should you do? That's your rice. Rest, ice, compress, and elevate. Epiphyseal plate fractures in children may do what? What is that epiphyseal plate? So remember, epiphyseal plate has to do with growth, and we don't want this child have a shorter leg or a crooked leg because of that. What findings for a patient in skeletal traction indicates peripheral neurovascular impairment? <clears throat> so if you don't have a pulse, blood flow is not getting down there. So that would be your thing that you would see and what you're going to be uh, assessing. How should the nurse care for the skeletal traction for a child with a fractured femur? So again, when you have that traction, the Buck's traction, skeletal traction, make sure those weights are hanging. That weight and the continuous pull is exactly what we need. If not, you're gonna misalign the bones and create a lot of muscle spasms. When caring for a nine-year-old in Buck's traction, what action by the nurse is correct? Remember, a buck's traction is due to a fractured femur. We want to make sure that the blood is flowing. So capillary refill. Going to keep watching that. A multi-select. Which assessment indicates an infant has developmental dysplasia of the hip? I mean, that ball of the femur is not in the hip properly. So it's up here somewhere. What would you see? So absolutely, you'll have those asymmetrical leg folds or gluteal folds. The moral reflex is more like a starl. That's, you know, for infants, the young ones. Babinski is just to see if your foot splays, if you have you no know, feeling there. It's the positive Ortolani sign and the folds. We want to hear if there's clicking going on in there. What's happening? 
And again, shorter leg you'd see. Which statement by parents indicates more teaching is needed regarding a two month old with club foot? I mean, how do we treat club feet? So we know we need to change that cast every week. So waiting for a month, what you've done with that quick healing on infants, you have made that foot not be in correct position. So every week this child must come in. And remember, as they get older, they're gonna need follow-up to make sure that their foot and ankle are still in good alignment. A multi-select. Osteogenesis imperfecta. What is that? Brittle bone disease, and it is a genetic issue. You're not going to do any aggressive physical therapy. You're going to break this child's bones. Many children, infants coming in, they are accused of child abuse until they diagnose this disease. And I've seen it before. So just because their bones were broken, in this case, it was due to an illness, not abuse. I can't imagine that. When can osteogenesis imperfecta be the most life-threatening? So that's going to be at birth. You know, when they're coming through that birth canal, they're squeezed. And then we're taking, we're pulling the head and the neck. This is when, you know, you can have more broken bones occur. What is the pathologic cause of leg calf birth disease? Well, what is it? I know treatment is bed rest and traction and NSAIDs. It's when the blood supply is, you know, somehow stopped going to the femoral head. So it's ischemic, ischemic, aseptic femoral head necrosis. Kyphosis, what's that? And that's the humpback. That's the upper thoracic spine that um, you'll see. Lordosis is and that's the lumbar spine that goes inwards. And you see that with Duchenne muscular dystrophy also. Scoliosis. What did I tell you to remember about scoliosis? And that's that S-shaped spine. You know, if you're over 45, you're gonna have surgery. If not, we're gonna do brace. Adolescents with scoliosis that have a 25% curvature of the spine would need to do what? And it's a brace 23 hours a day, over 45% is surgery. So physical therapy and a brace. What is osteomyelitis? Osteomyelitis is an infection of the bone requiring IV antibiotics. Very dangerous. 
juvenile rheumatoid arthritis or idiopathic, J-I-A, what is it? You know, GIA is when the body, the immune system attacks the joints. Goal is to relieve pain and keep motion. Goals. Oops. And it's to reduce um, pain and swelling of the joints. Systemic lupus erythematosus. So it is an autoimmune disease. The body attacks itself. I wish they understood why those things happened. Multi-select. What can help a child with lupus erythematosus prevent exasperations? So lupus, we know sun bothers them. So sunscreen, decreased exposure. And then this one, we're going to get those prophylactic um, antibiotics and steroids before procedures like dental. What organs can lupus affect? Any of them, any organ it likes. What is cerebral palsy? Mm. You know, that's with your body movements and muscle coordination. You know, the spastic is, you know, it's even more tense of the muscles. A myelomeningocele, what is that? What happens? So a myelomeningocele is when the lower back doesn't close and the meninges and spinal cord are all pulled up and sitting up there. So remember, there's a lot of stretching of nerves that go on. Infants with myelomeningocele demonstrate what? Remember, it's the meninges and you know the spinal cord are pulled up there and it's stretching those nerves. So you will see motor and sensory impairments. Sometimes, you know, it's decreased sensation. Um, and sometimes there's no sensation, no motor. Due to decreased motor and sensations of the lower extremities, what must the nurse monitor closely with a myelomeningocele? Remember that meninges and spinal cord have been pulled up and out and they've stretched nerves there. And our biggest concern is urinary retention. They don't feel they're full and they don't have the capacity to urinate. And many of these children end up getting catheterized for urine every four hours. And again, also, remember to monitor bowel function. They can't push. A key feature of Duchenne muscular dystrophy is what? What is that? Muscular dystrophy.
And it's all about muscles, progressive muscle wastage, which starts about age three. One of the, well, one of the procedures that a child with possible Duchenne's may need to diagnose the condition. So you're talking about muscles and decreasing muscle strength. Which one of these would do that? And there's a picture right here of it. And it is an electromyography, okay? Because what it does is it puts a impulse, a takes um, an electrical shock into the muscle and watching how it reacts to it. When you're done with these procedures, these child, these children are sore. It is painful because you're contracting these muscles. It's like you've done a marathon. So let the parent know and the child know it will hurt. How is Duchenne muscular dystrophy inherited? <clears throat> so Duchenne muscular dystrophy is inherited and it's through the mother, the X-linked. In caring for a patient with Gillian Barre, the priority concern is, usually it happens after upper respiratory, you're gonna see it start from the feet and you work up. And what is our concern that we need to monitor very closely? And that's making sure our airway is open and they're breathing because the phrenic nerve stops working. For a patient suffering with Gillian Barre, they would complain of weakness that was what? <clears throat> and it's ascending, feet up, okay? Has nothing to do with time of day. And then when you get better, you start breathing and it works down. A multi select treatment for Gillian Barre include so we, I mean, this is a uh, thing that happens due to a viral infection. So, antibiotics, no. It's IVIG, you're gonna give those immunoglobins and we are gonna be monitoring respiratory support. Um, heparin, that's part of the treatment, you know, prevention thing, but treatment for Guillain-Barre itself, IVIG and respiratory, usually intubation, tracheostomy. What type of cerebral palsy causes hypertonicity and poor fine motor skills? like my Jonathan. Oh. And it's called spastic. That is the one that you think of when you think of cerebral palsy, the spastic cerebral palsy. What priority action should a nurse take to a patient with a suspected spinal cord injury? Again, priority. And it's a mobilization of the spine and keeping it immobile. We don't want to rupture that spinal column. You should get a tetanus shot. When? How often? And they're now also doing diphtheria with these um, they felt that uh, you needed it. So it's diphtheria with your tetanus every, how many years? 10 years, good. 
which is a symptom of tetanus? Stepped on a rusty nail. Remember, it's from the clavicles up. And it's severe muscle spasms, which create re a respiratory compromise. It's also called lockjaw. And last question. Most common cause of spinal cord injuries are what? <laughs> Motor vehicles, driving a motor vehicle, or sports. Very good, guys. Let's see how we did. Number three, KW. Number two, an SB. And number one, almost the whole game, Anjanette. Good job, Anjanette. Number four, K in sunshine. Awesome. Please sign your attendance attestations. Don't forget. Remember, to look at your projects if you're less than, than a 90. I mean, you could get points back. So please go get your points and let me know. Have a good time. Good Wait, luck professor. on your exams. Yes. I need to talk to you. <laughs> okay.